just quickly want to introduce uh, a local author, uh, you know, one of our own historians who's wrote an amazing book about uh, some of the names here in New York City. So let's give a big round of applause for Rebecca Bratsby. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Tough act to follow, but I'm going to try. Um, so I want to talk to you tonight about what the names that we give our places tell us about who we are. And um, I'm just so you know, I'm a law professor. I teach at CUNY School of Law, and I write mostly about the environment. But I found that the way that we think about infrastructure in this city is deeply involved with questions of justice and questions of who bears burdens and who gets benefits. And <laughs> that case. All right. So um, I just want to. Um, Let's start with where we are. Could I have the next slide? Actually, can we have, can I have the next slide? If we could do that, maybe, we'll see. Okay, this guy, this is John Jacob Astor. He was, he had the distinction of being the most hated man in America. He was also the first, no, nobody's listening, but that's okay. Um, so he also was the first multimillionaire in America and those two things are not unrelated. At his death, he was the, world's fifth richest man with a fortune of roughly $2 billion in today's money. Um, he was born in Germany, came to the United States right after the end of the Revolutionary War. He came to join his brother, Heinrich, who had joined up with the Hessians to get here and then immediately bailed and opened a butcher shop because he came from a family of butchers. So John Jacob Astor came here to join his brother. He, again, the guy who died as the fifth richest man in the world. Um, he worked as a delivery boy until he married his landlord's wife. And her dowry let him start a business. And he started in the fur business. And it's too bad the cops aren't still here because the way that he made his money was by violating the law. So there was clear laws that you couldn't trade guns or booze for furs, but he did, and he made a fortune. And then once he had a fortune, he had this vision of national dominance. So he was going to have a series of trading posts across the country. He sent an expedition out to what is now Oregon, where they built Fort Astor, which is why there's an Astoria out in Oregon. During the War of 1812, the British captured and burned the fort, and the people who lived there fled back to US territory in the process of discovering the southern route to the Rocky Mountains that all of the, um, the westward settlers used, the ones who made it and didn't die on the way. So, um, oh, after, so about by 1830, Astor had a uh, monopoly on fur in the United States. But he decided he was done with that. He sold his, uh, all of his fur interests and went into real estate. And he wound up owning almost all of Southern Manhattan. And in fact, on his deathbed, he said, if I knew then what I know now, I would have bought all of Manhattan. Uh, and in fact, in fact, after Alexander Hamilton um, was, mur was killed by um, Aaron Burr, right, uh, while he was vice president, Burr sold his estate to Astor so he could get money to flee. And that's how he got the neighborhood of Soho. Um, so As Astoria is named after Astor, but he never came here. Never set foot in the place once. Okay, we can talk later. Um, the town is named after him because the town's founder, Stephen Hasley, was trying to get a big donation for a local seminary that he was establishing for girls' education. So he... Um, he, he made this deal, right? Name the town. We'll name the town after you if you give us money. Astor made a really piddly donation, not the grand donation they were hoping for, but the legislature nonetheless enacted an act to incorporate the village of Astoria and the name stuck. Uh, Astor could see Astoria from his home, his summer home, which was in Hellgate, right next to Gracie Mansion. He and Gracie were best friends. Another fun tidbit, when Astor died, the New York Herald 
published his will on the front page as part of a larger campaign that the state should tax landlords. So some things don't change. Um, so if we can see the next slide, we're going to get even more local. Talk about uh, Dittmar's Boulevard, right? Here we are on Dittmar's Boulevard. Dittmar's is named after Abram Dittmar's, who was the first mayor of Long Island City. And he was elected in 1870 when Long Island City was created by merging parts of a, uh, the village of Astoria that had just been created, right? So, and the hamlets of Ravenswood, Hunters Point, Blissville, and Dutch Kills. He was forced out, though, because he wouldn't play ball with the corrupt political machine. The next mayor, Henry de Bavoy, uh, nearly bankrupted Long Island City and wound up being um, arrested and convicted for embezzlement, at which point Dittmar's ran again, won again, but his power was stymied and he wound up uh, resigning. And then there was a caretaker mayor until Queens joined with New York City, uh, uh, with Manhattan and Brooklyn to form the greater um, city of New York. And in fact, Long Island City joined with, voted overwhelmingly to join because they wanted less corrupt government. So that's why they joined with Manhattan and Brooklyn. So the Dittmar's family were among the first residents here in Dutch Kills. They attained a patent to this land in 1647. Um, they then moved to, to Brooklyn and the Dittmar's neighborhood in Brooklyn is named after the same family. Um, then a branch of the family came back to Flushing. And um, during the revolution, Abraham Dittmar's Jr., who's the grandfather of our guy, our mayor guy, um, he was a, um, a leader in the Continental Army. Um, he was arrested by the British as a rebel and he was imprisoned. And then after the war, he became a local leader. And in, um, in, 18, in 1787, he was elected a town officer in Flushing. And in that capacity, he was tasked with two things, binding out poor children as apprentices and um, constructing a cage to capture hogs that were running through the city. So he was a, clearly an important political figure. His son was a guy named Dow. There were so many Dittmars named Abraham and Dow. It's like every generation, they alternated the names. So his son, uh, his Abraham um, pig guy's son, Dow, uh, studied medicine at Princeton, and then went to what is now British Guyana. And he practiced medicine there for a while, made a fortune, came back, bought a farm at Hellgate, built a house that is like right where um, Shore Boulevard um, intersects with Dittmar's Boulevard. And he practiced both farming and medicine there, lived there for the rest of his life. He died at a ripe old age. His son, Abram, was the mayor guy. Um, and he was a lawyer. His son was a lawyer. But the interesting thing about Dow was he married Anna Elvira Rikers. So the Dittmar's family and the Rikers family were connected by marriage. Um, that made Dow the brother-in-law of Andrew Riker and Richard Riker, who I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes. Uh, but let's get a little, oh, by the way, that's a letter that, I couldn't find any pictures of um, Abram um, Dittmar's, very frustrating, but that is a letter that he wrote to Samuel Tilden. If we could see the next slide. All right, so let's talk about Jackson Heights, named after John Clues Jackson, who was born in Britain in Stratfordshire. His mother, the mother's family owned a pottery, and that was a big business at the time. It was really ugly, dirty, hard work, but the people who owned the potteries, the people who most of the people who weren't there made a lot of money. So anyway, his mother's family owned a pottery. His uncles, his maternal uncles, took him and his brother in and taught them the trade. And then John and his brother headed to the US with their uncle's customer list to see if they could start their own business. So it was either you know, entrepreneurial spirit, Yankee ingenuity, or outrageous betrayal, depending on your perspective. But they did really well, and they built an empire quickly. And, um, and then labor unrest drove them into bakery, uh, into bankruptcy, because there were uh, worker riots in the potteries because people weren't being paid enough. And then John and Job realized that the money was not actually in making the pottery. The money was in being the middlemen. So they, they created an export-import business, and they again made a fortune. And John Clues wound up being really, really rich. And then he also married into the Riker family and married money. He married Martha Riker, who was Andrew Riker's daughter. And in fact, they built a house that was right in where Bryan High School is. And um, 
once they were living here in this area, John Jackson said, you know, it'd be really great if there were a road that went directly from my house to the docks in Flushing where my ships come in. So he built a road, Jackson Avenue, that connected his house and, of course, the ferry terminals um, with the port in Flushing. And it was a toll road, and so he charged people to use it. In 1871, the state used the power of eminent domain, which is the power to take private property for public use with just compensation. And they paid him at the time in 1871, $70,000, which is about $1.2 million for today. And that's how we have Jackson Avenue. Most of it is gone. Most of it is now Northern Boulevard. But some of it is still there and the name still is. So Jackson, once he wasn't importing pottery anymore, he was really interested in agriculture. Uh, he was really interested in particular in cattle breeding. And uh, Flushing at the time was a site of real agricultural innovation. The Parsons uh, had a nursery, Willits had a nursery, and there was a lot of, Queens was very rural and very focused on agriculture. And uh, Jackson became the qu president of the Queens Council, the Queens County Agricultural Society. And every year they would have a big fair and they would offer uh, prizes for things like best butter by a girl under 21, best trotters and harness driven by owner. Interestingly, uh, every time Jackson entered a, a category, he won. He did not, however, may enter the best butter by a girl under 21 <laughs> category, as far as I know. So he died in 1889, which was long before we had Jackson Heights. But Jackson Heights are a product of the Queensboro Bridge being built in 1908. Edward McDougall's Queensboro Corporation, which was inspired by the City Beautiful movement coming out of England and this idea of garden cities. Right? They built um, Sunnyside Gardens, and that's where we get the name Garden Apartments, by the way, is from those apartments in Sunnyside. And he was looking for a name for the neighborhood that would give it a sense of class, and he picked Jackson, um, and that's where we get Jackson Heights. Um, so, let's see, what else do I want to tell you about him? Really nothing else about him. Oh, yes, I do. Um, I, what I want to tell you about is about the Queensboro Corporation apartments because they were this idea of, this idealized rural living where you're going to have um, close to nature but all the amenities of the city and very nice apartments. The pitch, just like now, was come from Manhattan, you'll pay the same price, but you'll get more space. So again, nothing changes. Actually, but what really changed is that these apartments were racially restricted. They were racially restricted and religiously restricted. No blacks, no Jews, no Catholics. And um, in 1948, in a case called uh, Shelley versus Kramer, the Supreme Court ruled that those kinds of racial restrictions were unenforceable. But they still existed, and the, what they couldn't, the Supreme Court couldn't do, was stop people from privately agreeing to, um, take, you know, to abide by them. And it really took until the Fair Housing Act of 1968 to break down the segregation and prejudice and give us the Jackson Heights we have now, with the incredible food and the vibrant, um, you know, multicultural community. All right. So um, next slide. I'm only going to talk to you for a couple more minutes. This is why I wrote the book. Okay, this is um, my experience of traveling on the Major Negan. And um, I used to have to take the Major Negan a lot because my parents live in Pennsylvania, and at the time it was the easiest way to get to the George Washington Bridge before I realized that it's always better to take the Harlem River Drive. So we were always stuck in traffic, and um, I don't behave well in traffic. I would get mad, I would curse, and I was always cursing Major Negan. And I was like, who is this guy? I hate him. And um, my family finally got sick of me saying that and said, well, why don't you find out who he was? And it was just really strange. It's like, we all take the Major Deegan, those of us who drive to the George Washington Bridge from here. Not a, nobody has a clue who the guy was. So when I started to investigate, I thought, well, you know, he's a war hero of some kind. Nope. Um, or I thought, well, you know, he died in battle. Nope. I mean, he was actually a major. But um, he was way less impressive than you might think, given that like the road that goes past Yankee Stadium bears his name. Um, he was a major during World War I, and he served the entirety of World War I here in New York, building fortifications. He was an architect by training. And you know, building fortifications in New York is not 
insignificant, right? It's an important thing to do, but it's hardly the stuff of legend that gets you a road named after him. Uh, he served under General George Washington Gothels, who the Gothels Bridge is named after, who also never served a day in battle, even though he was the most famous general of his era, and he was the guy who finished the Panama Canal. So um, who was this guy, Deegan? Um, actually, if you go to the next slide, I can show you a picture of it. Uh, in the working title of my book, which is actually called Naming Gotham, was who was that Major Deegan? But the publisher was like, yeah, that's a terrible title. Don't, don't call it that. Uh, so um, William Francis Deegan was the child of Irish immigrants. He um, trained at Cooper Union. Um, it was not called Cooper Union then. It was called Cooper, whatever it was before it became Cooper Union. And um, Pierre Cooper, who was also in the book, is also a really fascinating character. Um, and during World War I, again, he designed fortifications in New York. And the, what he did, though, that got that put him on the national scene was he helped form the American Legion after World War I. He was the first state commander of the American Legion. And in that role, he was a passionate advocate for returning veterans, for their medical care, for jobs, for be their benefit. And he was often fighting with the Veterans Bureau over that because he was really trying to stick up for the veterans. And it, it was really important work, and he did it pretty well. Um, and then he was also best friends with Mayor Jimmy Walker, known for a right, gentleman Jim, known for his sort of debonair attitude, but also known for corruption. Uh, and um, Walker appointed him as tenement commissioner, uh, which, a, a job that Deegan was qualified for. He was an architect, and he did a pretty good job as tenement commissioner. Tenement commissioner is sort of the, the equivalent of, today would be the equivalent of uh, housing and preservation commissioner. As tenement commissioner, he was in charge of enforcing the tenement laws, which are the laws that give us things like two means of ingress and egress in a bedroom, lights in the hallways, and uh, the basic sanitary things that we take for granted in terms of housing. And Deacon, in that role, took the important public stand against pigeons. New York City, apparently a lot of people in New York City liked to raise pigeons, and they would put pigeon coops on the roof, and Deegan, first of all, was concerned that they were a fire hazard, which they were, but he was also convinced that they spread polio, which they don't. So pigeon fanciers lobbied him, begging him, and one guy even like threatened to renounce his US citizenship if Deegan didn't revoke his evil decrees against pigeon coops. But um, the, the pitch that they used was, we need pigeons for war readiness. How are we going to send the messages? And Deacon was like, uh, dude, it's the 1920s. We don't do that anymore. But um, he was, by all accounts, a nice guy. People liked him. He died young. He died um, in his 40s, complications from appendicitis. His buddy, Mayor Jimmy Walker, was at his bedside when he died. He'd had a, a really contentious divorce. Um, his wife wasn't there, but his longtime girlfriend, who was um, the um, the niece of Senator Wagner was also at his bedside when he died. And his funeral was a full boat military affair with flyovers by army planes and military bands and 160 honorary pallbearers, including two U.S. senators and Mayor Jimmy Walker. And um, at the time, the road connecting the Grand Concourse in the Bronx with the Triborough Bridge was being built. It was named after him. And then when um, the major became the Major Deegan Expressway, thank you, Robert Moses, it, they kept the name. By the way, the Major Deegan Expressway was intended to alleviate congestion. That was its purpose. The Van Wick, alleviate congestion. The Holland Tunnel, alleviate congestion. The Brockner, the Sheridan. All of these, all of this infrastructure was pitched to us, the people who paid for it, as this will alleviate congestion. And all it did was create more congestion. Because building automobile infrastructure makes more people drive, which creates more traffic and more infrastructure uh, and more congestion. And um, I just wanted to say that. So, um, Oh, we're back on Dean. Um, so I think I have one more slide. 
the Rikers, you know, I think in order, interest of time, I'm just going to skip telling you that much about the Rikers. Rikers Island obviously is named after the Rikers. Andrew Riker was a privateer. He sailed um, to, he had two privateering vessels during the War of 1812. A privateer is basically a pirate with a license from the government, so it's not piracy. And uh, to raise the money for his ships, to outfit them with guns, he had the two biggest privateers sailing out of New York, he sold shares. So um, again, Yankee entrepreneurship maybe, right? You could buy a share in his voyages and that entitled you to a percentage of whatever he captured and brought into the prize courts here in New York and was awarded. Richard Riker was the city's recorder. In that capacity, uh, he was the one who signed manumission certificates when slaves were freed here in New York. And he also had a darker role. He was part of what came to be known as the kidnapping club in the run-up to the Civil War. So when the first fugitive slave law was enacted, he was the recorder. And that required northern states to use their civil machinery to re- capture people who had escaped slavery and send them back to enslavement, which was bad enough. But the kidnapping club came up with this brilliant idea that they could just grab random free black people off the streets of New York, deny them the right of habeas corpus, and send them into slavery and make money off of it. So the book is called Naming Gotham, the Villains, Rogues, and Heroes Behind New York Place Names. He's really one of the villains. And then if you could just skip ahead to the two slides, that's the map of the book. Just go to the last one. This is the last slide. I just wanted to tell you who these people are. So beard guy on the upper right, that's Peter Cooper, uh, founder of the Cooper, well, Cooper Institute, which became the Cooper Union, uh, fascinating inventor. He had one year of education and it made him really want to provide education to other people, which is why he started Cooper Institute. He also convinced Ezra Cornell to start Cornell, Cornelius Vanderbilt to start Vanderbilt, uh, Carnegie to start Carnegie Mellon. So a lot of the really elite private institutions that we have, and Vassar also, Elias Vassar to start Vassar, are because Peter Cooper had a mission and he shared it with his other cohort of really rich guys. Below him, that's Henry Bruckner. He, the Bruckner Expressway is named after him. Uh, again, super corrupt, was caught up in all the corruption scandals. He was known for having, um, um, what are those things called? The, the, the boxes that you have at the bank, you know, where you keep stuff. I can't think what they're called. He had, um, he had about 15 of them that he visited multiple times, had about hundreds of thousands of dollars in the 1930s in his uh, boxes in the bank. And um, that's Shirley Chisholm, right? She really doesn't need much explanation. She's first black woman in Congress. She was elected from um, Brooklyn. There's a great, incredible park named after her now. And the guy that you can't see is Jackie Robinson, who everybody knows. So with that, I'm just gonna stop. Oh, and that's me. Yeah, that's how you can reach me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for staying. I really appreciate it. It's been a very long night. And thanks. Um, I do have a few over there. Uh, if you want to, sure. Ones if anybody wants to buy. Does anybody have questions? Well, I just wanted to add about the John Jacob Astor part. Um, when I was in real estate, as Diane is and other people, on 14th Street, I was selling a mansion, and she swore that she was a descendant, and that used to be yeah, one of his her. summer homes. So during the course of the sales, she passed away from uh -huh. cancer. I never did document it. But also next door, the Tabies also had underground tunnels, maps of them, uh -huh. leading to the water so that they could bring without getting snowed on and stuff like that. Cool. They have underground tunnels. Then the other thing is my cousin just came from Europe. Uh -huh. And he said that in every city, Belgrade, Serbia, um, Croatia, um, Romania, there's an Astoria Hotel named after right. John I, I left out the, the hotel business part, which came after the yeah. real estate. And business. the Empire State Building is built on Astor's property. Thank you. Anybody else?
I should say it on the mic or just tell it. Oh, one more thing. Did you know that Clement Moore grew up in Elmhurst, that that's where his family's estate was originally? The night before Christmas, when all through the house, it was written by Clement Moore, who lived in, grew up in Elmhurst, and then he inherited the um, Chelsea property in Manhattan. For the online people, could you repeat? They don't for, for those three online people, no. Yeah, sign up for the uh, website. Th thanks, everybody, for showing up. Appreciate it. Thanks to Rivercrest, right? And Kira, especially, for her kind hospitality to us all. Well, thanks so much.